Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> what, okay. what, what? Are we on? Yeah. Yeah, we're on. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell it's been a while since we've done this because um, the wife can't even tell that we're on. But no, um, it's really great to be back. Uh, this is Mac. And next to me is my beautiful wife, Myra. Uh, we do this Mac and Myra Sunday. But we haven't really done it for, gosh, I guess it's close to a month. Mm -hmm. um, so forgive us if we are already like starting out and giggling and, and um, uh, not quite as sharp as we normally are. But it is really great to be back. Um, we have actually been away from our home in Baltimore for about three months now. And um, during that time, Myra was uh, specifically in Guatemala and I was in Guatemala for a minute too. And then I went out to both Kenya and Rwanda. And um, from those uh, two locations, came back to be with my beloved Myra back here in Baltimore. And uh, neither one of us has been here. Well, I guess I've been here. Have I been here a whole week yet? No. Not yet. Um, but I'm a couple, I got in a couple of days before she did. Um, but we both um, have been here less than a week. And so we're just getting used to uh, getting around and finding things in our own home. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it's good to be here. Um, the travel was very fruitful. I'm sure over the course of the next several weeks, we'll probably be talking more about certain things that have happened. But suffice it to say that God has been very, 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 very good to both of us. Um, like everybody else, we've had uh, some challenges along the way, but we've also seen the hand of God literally upon us. And for that, we are thankful. I'm not going to be uh, long-winded here in this uh, introduction, but we do want to uh, give honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we also want to appreciate each and every one of you who uh, support us and not just uh, what we're doing here with uh, Mac and Myra, but also in our ministry efforts um, to be able to address the needs of God's people worldwide. And you guys have been so instrumental in uh, supporting us and we just want to take an opportunity to just say thank you thank you and don't think that just because I'm being really nice now doesn't mean that uh, <laughs> tomorrow I'll probably be asking you for more money for something but but know that <clears throat> your hard-earned dollars for uh, the things that we are asking for go a long way in order for us not only to minister to the natural needs, but also to the spiritual needs of our people. And so with that said, uh, today's subject is why aren't we walking in our inheritance? This is a subject that was brought to the table by my very beloved Myra Sugar Cookie herself. And so, <laughs> I have an expectation that <clears throat> what she's going to share with us today is going to be awesome. So I'm going to uh, stop talking. I'm going to let her do what she does and pray us in and just uh, start to share what it is that God has revealed to her. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for each opportunity that you give us to show forth your love. Because even as we speak about things that might be a little different from 
what we used to, it's all about love because anything that you share to us is, is for the sake of love, Father. Your love for us, your sacrifice for us, that we would learn how to be more like you in everything that we do and everything that we say because you are love, Father. The sacrificial love that causes our hearts to sing and to understand more and more and desire to know more and more about the great sacrifice that you made through your son Jesus Christ for our sake, for us who, who don't deserve any of that. So Lord, help us to understand the sacrifice of your love and the depth of your love that we would understand your spirit and understand your word to a greater degree than we've ever done before. We love you, we honor you, we praise you, we worship you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, in the course of the time that Mac was away, um, uh, I had a daily habit of reading my Bible at night, which I usually don't because that's usually the time that we spend together. But since he wasn't around, I changed, and at night I would read. And it just hit me so many so many different ways, um, some words that I hadn't even thought about before. I listened to, actually I watch, uh, different churches on Sundays uh, because our church is, is in Guatemala and the hours are different so I can listen to other people's sermons on the hours that we don't have church. And... Um, in one particular church, in other churches, I heard people praying, and and they would pray that I am a sinner saved by grace, and that just did something to me. Mac and I had talked about it. I mean, he had brought it up, and it just said, you know, why is that said like that? And we've talked about it before, but in one of my readings uh, one night, I was in the book of Hebrews, and in the book of Hebrews, it was talking about inheritance, that we are, we are God, you know, we are inheritance, we have an inheritance, uh, we are, we are, in Romans it talks about, um, we are co-heirs with Christ, and that kind of pushed me, because one of the statements was heir of salvation, so, you know, to me, that means that there's a blood relationship, which we know because of the shed blood of Jesus. And in that relationship, that means that we are connected to him. We are one with him. So how can we be a sinner? Now, we know we're saved by grace. We were sinners. But how can we say, I am a sinner? And it made me think about why do we say that? And, you know, I was there at one point. I think I, I must have said it before. So I looked it up because there really is no scripture. There's no scripture that says, I am a sinner saved by grace. But the reference is to Ephesians 2. So to me, saying I'm a sinner, how can I inherit anything as a, as a bloodline of Christ if I'm a sinner? Because, you know, it even says in Ephesians, we're going to be sitting in high places with him. And a sinner is going to be sitting in high places with them? Like, it was all kind of contradictory. So some of these scriptures are what we've heard. But I want you to open your ears to, to really what it's saying. Because we get certain terms that we all kind of embedded in our heart. And we don't really look at what was written before after those terms. And who are they talking to? And what is it about? Why are they saying these things? So I went to Ephesians 2. It led me to Ephesians 2. This is the New King James Version. And you, were, and you, he made alive. Now, it says, who are dead in trespasses and sin. Who were dead in trespasses and sin. So there's death and sin, but there's a life in Christ. We're alive. So we're dead to sin. In which you once walked, according to the course of this world. So we were sinners walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of a disobedience, because that's who we were. 
among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, to see, were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love for, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. We were sinners, but he made us alive. We were dead in our sin, and he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So sinners are sitting in heavenly places. That's not what it's saying. We are alive together with Christ. And that grace has saved us. That in the ages to come, because we have a hope, we have a future, to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He, he can boast about this. Look, look. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So that even tells you right there there's a predestination in our salvation because he knows who is really going to be saved. And then it, going to Romans 3, they're, they're discussing circumcision, which is there's the Greek and there's the Jew. And the, the Jews think that they, they are all that because they had a relationship with God. And here comes these so-called infidels who have confessed mm -hmm. Christ. And they're saying, the Jews are saying, well, you need to put on, you know, this circumcision because that's truly. But, you know, the, the word through Paul is saying, no, there's no extra stuff you have to do. It's all by the grace of God. That's, that's a work, even if you get circumcised. So he's saying, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. And this is as it is written, but this is Old Testament. There is none righteous, no, not one. When they say as it is written, they're in New Testament, but they're going back to the Old Testament. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There's none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poisons of asps, like snakes, is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. Now, that's us in sin but they're referring to the old testament because they had no salvation they were under the law because it says that now we know that whatever the law says it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before god therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin if we didn't have the law, we, didn't, we wouldn't have known we were sinners. But this is a different law that because of Christ is bringing in, you say law? Yeah, there's a law. Romans three twenty three to 24. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe that's the difference we believe and that has transformed us from a state of sin to the state of salvation and newness in life for there is no difference listen to this this is where it comes mm. in for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God who's he talking about all of us have sinned but this was before we believed they're not talking about now. He's saying, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, 
whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, that's the sacrifice, through faith, that's what he's saying, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins. They said he has passed over the sins that were previously committed. All the sins that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. That mm. he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in in Jesus who believes where is boasting then it excluded by what law of works no by the law of faith that's the law the law of faith therefore we conclude a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law since the law of faith nullifies our sin for the grace and the justification of Christ and what is justification? One definition says it's an act by which God moves a willing person from the state of sin, injustice, to the state of grace, which is justice. We have been justified. It's all him. He's doing this only because we believe. So he's moving us away from that state of sin. And he's moving us to the state of grace which brings with it a different understanding. We are no longer sinners according to his word. It's our flesh that has to be transformed. It's our flesh that has to be renewed. But in him, we, us, we are no longer sinners. Philippians 2 says, If there be therefore any consolation, it's beautiful, if there be any consolation, in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mer of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be like men. It, it's, it's a plea that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better themselves. We have the overcome and relearn what truly God is. His state, his righteousness, his willingness to sacrifice his son for us. Not, look not at any man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. This is Paul writing through the Spirit. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now I hear a lot of people saying that, but then they say, I'm a sinner saved by grace it was like that nullifies that because that this mind is this it's like christ jesus mind is in me then i'm a sinner no who being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men i'm all that i don't think so when you say i'm number one no we're number two or three <laughs> it depends on who who else we have put above us we don't even have to be number two we could be number three but we're definitely not number one no one is number one but him and being found in a fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to death even the death of the cross wherefore god also have highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name when we put him in front of us it makes a difference how can we say I'm a sinner after all that he's gone through? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things upon the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We introduce ourselves to someone who does not know the Lord and we say, I'm a sinner, but I've been saved by grace. That's confusing. Because they can say, I'm a sinner too. Uh, how, what, what kind of testimony is but listen to this wherefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence this is Paul 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Because we have a charge. If we are no longer sinners in the eyes of God, we have to work out our own salvation and look to God. Because it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Are we doing that? Are we working out our, 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 our salvation with fear and, fear and trembling? Or we're just saying, I'm saved, although I do sin, because all people sin. We've all come short of the God. Taking everything out of context, because that's not what he's saying. He's saying, in, outside of Christ, we are all going to fail. We're all dead. But in Christ, there's no death. There's life. There's growth. There's encouragement. There's looking forward. There's hope. And some of that comes with fear and trembling because our flesh is fighting to be in control. And we, it, he died. He suffered. And we have to die to our own flesh and suffer because it's a suffering to tear away from what we want, what we desire. But what does God want for us? We want to have his mind. And God was obedient. Do we want to be obedient children? 1 Timothy 1.12, and this is, this is really interesting because here we have another thing that Paul says, and I'm not afraid to use this scripture because it's important to understand the humility of, of Paul. And he's in 1 Timothy, he's teaching, and he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, that he counted me faithful, putting me into this ministry. We could all say that. Who before, he said, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, injurious. I mean, he had people murdered. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorant, ignorantly in unbelief. Because he was ignorant of Christ and his glory. And the grace of God, of the Lord, was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He says that. To save sinners. But he's talking about all that he was because he was a great sinner in his own eyes when he looks at where he is now. Mm -hmm. And he looks at how God enabled him, how he counted him faithful, putting him in ministry. A person who was out there killing the believers in Christ how justified he has been by Christ. He said, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. It's a pattern that just because there is no sin greater than rejecting the Holy Spirit. But the sins that we have done when we come into Christ, he has already forgiven us when we believe. It's a pattern. It's not like, oh, I'm going to make a dress from this pattern, but I don't like the way the sleeves are because I'm going to adjust it. No, this is a pattern that's written in heaven that no man can be rejected if he truly believes. And God knows who that is that he truly believes in him, he will forgive him of all the sin that he has, had done before. And that was Paul. No great sin -er was he. He, said he was the chief. And he's talking to people about his life. He's talking to people that he wants to convince and encourage in the Lord. But he's not afraid to tell them, I was terrible. I kill people like you. Hmm. I was a murderer. I I look it doesn't matter. I children, women, old men. And look, God has put me in ministry. In Hebrews 1 3, and this is where I started, but this is where I'm ending. He says in Hebrews 1 3, who being the brightness of his glory, 
and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. If you don't know that word, think about it, purged. That means it's like he threw that away. He spit it out. He wiped it out, purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high because it was done. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies my footstool? Are they not the angels, all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister to them for them who shall be heirs of salvation? As we're working out our soul salvation, that's our hope and our call. It's written, we are heirs of salvation because we believe and he has forgiven us and we are no longer sinners in his eyes. We are heirs of salvation. Such a great salvation. No one can take that away from us. Only we can do that by walking away from it and truly walking in sin, which is death. But we are alive. We're not dead. Romans 8 says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. That's the flesh. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, shall bring alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, not to our sin nature, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. It's still a challenge. It's still a struggle. But it shouldn't be, beloved. For as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Who doesn't want to be in that family? Who doesn't want to be called a son or a daughter of God? But you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear because sin has nothing to give us but fear. But we have received the spirit of adoption where we can cry, Abba, Father. That's Daddy. Mm. That's an intimacy. <clears throat> There's, he is fearful in an awesome kind of way, but he's also Daddy. He has an intimacy with us when we're willing to allow him that makes it home. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and that children that heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Does that sound like a sinner? If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together by reckoning that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So we're no longer illegitimate. We're legitimate in our faith in Christ because of our faith in Christ. True heirs through the shed blood over us that has joined us to him as his very own, no longer hidden in darkness, but released to newness of life. We are without excuse. I was talking to him, I was right at, at our meal, and I said, remember what Jesus said about who is my mother and my brother? Those who do the will of God. Are we doing the will of God? Mm. Are we truly acting like heirs and children of God? Do we make decisions based on our obedience to the word of God and what he represents in this world? Or we slipping and sliding along with the, the mess that's in this world. As Christians, we are without excuse. God has put a seal upon our heart. That seal is the Holy Spirit that belongs to him. That says we are his. And when we walk in our flesh, because it has to be our flesh, with it's against the will of God. We're saying to him, your death on the cross has no meaning. It has no value because I'm going to still do what I want to do, what I believe, what the world says, what the culture says. Then you, 
we, because none of us can say what will happen tomorrow. But if we stay diligent and we remember the great sacrifice he has done, what he has done to pull us out of that darkness into the marvelous light, set us up on high with him, heirs, not so much of a kingdom of riches and gold, but a kingdom that is incorruptible. Because what we're living in today is full of corruption, but in our spirit, by faith in Jesus Christ, we could be living an incorruptible life day by day by day, dying to those things that don't represent the salvation that we have within us that says you are no longer a sinner. You have been saved by grace. So I come against that statement. I am a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner, and I am saved by grace. Amen. Amen. Woo. Say it with conviction, baby. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, not to uh, belabor the point, but this, um, this whole... Sinner saved by grace. This um, this whole dialogue about calling oneself a sinner when you have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, and I mean not just accepted, but you are walking in perpetual discipleship mm -hmm. because. I, I, I'm of the belief that many are saved, but many are not walking in the salvation in which God has given you grace to have. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I find it really amazing that Anyone who understands the cross and the significance of what happened at the cross could ever call themselves a sinner again mm -hmm. if, a conditional, if you have died mm -hmm. to those things that are of old. Again, you know, Second Corinthians 5, 17, I can't escape it if any man be in Christ mm -hmm. He's a new creature, or I like the versions that say new creation. You know, the, those things, those sins, those weights that previously had us in bondage. I believe that we can actually get rid of that, not of our own power, but mm -hmm. by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Mm -hmm. How do you call yourself a sinner and then in the same breath say, but the Holy Spirit lives in me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if Christ died for sin, singular, mm -hmm. sin, sin, sin being anything that is unrighteous, he didn't just die for sin of the past, sin of the present, but he died for all sin. We keep talking about the fact that it is finished mm -hmm. and the, the finished work of Christ is that Satan was served a mandate that you're not going to have the authority over my people mm -hmm. any longer, no longer would we need to sacrifice animals as an atonement for sin? Because today, I've stepped to the plate. I'm the one. My <laughs> blood, my perfect blood is sufficient to cover a multitude of sin forever and ever. Any sin 
that could ever be performed by any one individual or by collective, it was all settled. And because of that, again, and I know Myra's not saying this either, we don't walk around just willfully being in disobedience to God. But if we should find ourselves unawares and realize after the fact that, oh man, I, I've missed the mark. Mm -hmm. We do ask for forgiveness, but understanding that that forgiveness was settled right. at the cross. He doesn't have to go back on that cross. And, and my fear, mm -hmm. beloveds, is that every time that we say, I'm a sinner, mm. we just put him back oh, on that cross again. And that is not what we're supposed to do. And, and trust me, I'm, I wasn't even going here, uh, but I, I literally had an encounter with a young man. I won't mention his name because he could actually be watching this, but I asked him straight up, are you a sinner? Now, I want to give you some qualifications for this young man that I'm talking about because the young man actually came and witnessed to me while I was on a plane. And so I believe the sincerity of his heart. I remember when I was him. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when I asked him if he was a sinner, he said, yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I had to mm -hmm. share with him some things like, look, as long as we're in this flesh, there's a sin nature here. We're not going to be perfect as long as we have this. Right. This will always separate us from God. But as Jesus promised, he gave us a comforter, knowing that we would need help, knowing that we would need support. And that comforter who ended up of making an appearance in Acts chapter 2 uh, on the day of Pentecost, now can live inside of us. And the person that understands this is careful about what they do with their body, careful about what they say, even careful about some of the things that they see because mm -hmm. there is not just our concerns to think about, but it's literally the holiness of God. So forgive me, dear. Um, but we have to make it plain here. And thank, thank you, Myra, for, for making that a focal point of this thing. How can you even uh, enjoy an inheritance hmm. if you think that you're not deserving of it by his grace, mm -hmm. key thing, by his grace. So with that said, let me get into what I actually was going to share with you guys. Um, remembering our subject is why aren't we walking in our inheritance? Well, you know, yours truly, I always have to define these things because I don't want to make any assumptions that people even understand what an inheritance is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, an inheritance can be good and it can be bad. It depends <laughs> on who you're inheriting from or uh, the uh, attitude of consequences that you find yourself in, uh, in at, at the point of having the opportunity to receive an inheritance. So let's talk about that. So I did, you know, I'm getting a little older, so I have to jot these things down because my mind is all over the place. So the first thing is, what is an inheritance? I mean, simple stuff. So in the theological sense, to inherit means to receive an irrevocable gift. Mm. I, I love this. Mm. Irrevocable. It cannot be taken away. All right? With an emphasis 
on the special relationship between the benefactor and the recipients. Unlike legal inheritance, or dare I say human inheritance, the benefactor in this case is God. Mm. Now, in human terms, the benefactor has to die mm. before you receive the inheritance, but God never dies. So this is what makes the inheritance that we could have through him even more special because the benefactor God does not die, yet he provides material and spiritual, uh, excuse me, spiritual blessings for his people. So why does God provide us with an inheritance? Okay, because God, if, if I'm looking at it from my lens, I mean, my gosh, I feel like I'm walking in the inheritance right now just by being able to share with you guys on this platform just to be alive. Every day I wake up, I'm like, thank you, Lord, because it could be different. So like a good father, now fathers uh, in the best sense are providers. Mm -hmm. And like a good father, God provides for those he calls his children. In your own time, read Proverbs 13, 22. Okay, he is inclined to provide for his children. Guess what? Because he loves mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny. Today we were um, at a, a, a service, a worship service, and uh, the, the angel of the house just stopped everything and just told everybody to just tell somebody that you love them and some other things. But the, the key emphasis is love, 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 love. Mm -hmm. And and that's the, the way God is. God is love. We know that we can only love him because he first loved us. So he becomes the epitome <laughs> and the example of love. And so if we are in Christ, we also get um, immediate education on love. And so love is at the key, because of course, if he's a good, good father, that's who he is, then he wants to provide benefits for his children. So how does God provide this inheritance? God has chosen those in Christ. And this is what Myra was talking about before, this big old word we call predestination. But God has chosen us uh, before creation of the world to be holy and blameless. Mm -hmm. Listen, just the fact that he's saying holy and blameless, <laughs> when we know that we were born in sin, shaping in iniquity, lets you know that something has to happen in order for the slate to be wiped clean, that God can look upon us as holy and blameless. You know, tomorrow morning I could walk out of here and do something wrong, and by the standards of man, we'll have fallen short. And I think that's where the confusion comes in. But God is not looking at me through that same lens. He's not looking at Myra through that same lens. He's not looking at you all who have believed. He's not looking at us through that same lens. He is looking at us through the blood of Christ. Right. Just like the, the blood that was put upon the doorpost. Uh, back during the Exodus. Okay, that's the way God is seeing it. Those people were not innocent, but those people were God's chosen, and God decides who He's going to bless, when He's going to bless, where He's going to bless, why He's going to bless, and it was His determination 
that he was going to save his people from the bondage of Egypt. And this was the sign. Always look at the blood. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know it was the blood that saved me. <laughs> that I'm serious. Mm -hmm. You know, we sing it in the song, but, but it's real. Mm -hmm. Okay. And honestly, if we tapped in more to the Jewishness of what we believe, because you can't have Christianity without the Jews. If we tap into that and understand the importance of blood and knowing that Jesus came as our high priest, his blood is more than sufficient to eradicate the penalty of sin forever and ever. And I am crazy enough to believe that we can make a decision today that we just will not do things outside of God's will. Mm -hmm. It can be done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're walking around huh, a sinner, then I think you need to go back to the drawing board to find out what it is that you really believe and who you really believe and stop falling for the, the doctrine of man and listen to the voice of God, sorry. So anyway, we're predestined to be adopted as his children through the redeemed blood of Christ. And ultimately it is his perfect will mm -hmm. that provides for those he has chosen to be his children. It's his will, not our will, his will, all right? So we don't have to understand it. It's his will. Amen. And heaven and eternity with him is our reward. <laughs> if you think that the new Beamer that's sitting outside your home, if you think the new career that uh, you've been able to establish, if you think anything of a material sense is really the provision that God has for you, that I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, you are misunderstanding what's going on here. Did you not know that Satan can easily uh, uh, open up an opportunity for you to uh, get something of a material nature? Hey, if I find $20 on the sidewalk, did God bless me or is Satan tempting me? You, 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 you know, so things can work either way. So we can't look at the material. We have to look at the spiritual to know that the greatest reward will never be found in this world. So if you know this in advance, why do we sweat the small stuff? Why aren't we walking in our inheritance? Because we have believed the doctrine of men. And we have believed the systems of this world. So when does the believer know that they have this guarantee of inheritance? And it's simply put, upon receiving the Holy Spirit. The believer has a guarantee of inheritance again I think Myra referenced this earlier too. Um, you can just go to Ephesians 1, uh, verses 13 through 14. I've got so much scripture to read today. You guys find that for yourself. That's your homework assignment. <laughs> All right. So, foundation scripture number one. Hebrews 9, 16 through 22. I'm going to read this. This one I am going to read. This is under the heading of why aren't we walking in our inheritance? So I'm going to address the subject matter straight up. So, and I'm reading from the New King James Version here. So it says, for where there is a testament, mm -hmm. there, must also, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Oh my 
God. Let, let me put a pen in it. When I read this, oh my gosh, it helped me understand even more clear the difference between old covenant and new covenant. So let me explain. Anytime we're talking about a testament, a covenant, mm -hmm. death has to be part of it. It, it. it messed me up, Myra. Let me tell you something. I started to think right in Genesis. Mm -hmm. Genesis. By the time you get to Genesis 3, the very first death took place because up until that point, man, woman, and any children that would have come on the scene would have lived forever. But right in the first book of the Bible, mm -hmm. there's death. Mm -hmm. Death of mankind, but even more so, death of innocence. We will never be innocent again. Mm -hmm. I Honestly, nobody comes in here innocent any longer. It died. Mm -hmm. Okay? It, it Oh, then by the time we get to Malachi and we get to those years where the Bible says that God was silent. That was the beginning of the death of the new, excuse me, of the old covenant. Not that the old covenant is not relevant, but my gosh, it was the ending of one thing and the glorious introduction of a new thing, New Testament, new covenant. All right? And, and so everything is revolving around the death. Here it talks about the testator, that could be the benefactor, something is always going to die. In the old covenant, animals died for the atonement of human beings. Of course, in the new covenant, one man, that man, Jesus, died mm -hmm. that mankind would have the hope of glory mm -hmm. to be able to spend eternity with God our Father. Death is all over everything. I've even gone to uh, our global communities, whether it be teaching or preaching, and told them, you want to change uh, the adversity that's going on in your country? Someone has to be willing to die in order that the whole may live. And once we understand this, oh my gosh, it lets you know that the only real death that we can experience, those of us who are believers, is just this humanity. Mm -hmm. But we never really die. <laughs> so... My God, God has given us this beautiful situation and all that he's asking of us is for us to believe him, the one who made us. Look, for there is a testament. There must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Why do you think Jesus had to die? <laughs> oh, okay, therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. Again, I'm, I talked about that with with. Animals, but let's continue. For when Moses has spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats 
with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then, likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Now understand this, in the old covenant, God established uh, two things, uh, one being the tabernacle and, or, 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 or tent, mm -hmm. and then also the temple. So, so the tabernacle was one that was like the moving location where people could fellowship, but you could pack it up and move it all around. But the temple stood in its location, wherever it was constructed. So when the new covenant comes into place, the need for tents and tabernacles and temples changed because they became about the collection, the embodiment of believers. We became the living tabernacle, the living tent, the living uh, temples and tabernacles. That's who we are, beloveds. No longer will we need to carry God around <laughs> from station to station. <laughs> you understand? So, so even that system died. What am I saying? Churches everywhere, churches every encounter that we have with like-minded people so that, you know, we can fellowship one with another and we can call it church. We can call it a gathering. We can call it an assembly. And it doesn't have to be that we have to always get in a car and drive somewhere. Or it doesn't mean that just on Sunday we're going to go to church. All right. It doesn't mean that. I don't know how many times I can express this, but it's every time that we see fit to just come together, whether it's in a fellowship over food, fellowship over teaching, fellowship over just praying and praising. Guys, that is the ecclesia. That is the church, not the stuff that they're telling you, not that we have to sign up and have church membership. And if we're not there on a particular Sunday, we get called out and guilted. No, it's just life becomes the ecclesia, living people coming together. And so all of that died with Christ. I don't know if I can make it any clearer than that. So anyway, that's the foundation. All right, so now let's talk about this. Why some are not walking in the inheritance according to the scriptures that I just read in Hebrews 9, 16 through 22? Because if we're not addressing the subject matter, why aren't we walking in inheritance? We haven't done our job. So I'm going to do, do our job as Myra has done her job. So... Number one reason is because they have not taken on the nature of Christ mm. and died of their own sin. So I left the best uh, for <laughs> last. We got to die too. We got to yeah. do some dying. Mm -hmm. All right. Not physical death, but we got to do some dying to mm -hmm. some stuff. Okay. Listen to this from 1 Peter 2 verse 24 who himself, that would be Christ, 
bore our sins in his own body on a tree that we, having died to sins. Okay, once again, Tamara's point, if we say we've died to sin, <laughs> how are we sinners? Yeah. Please answer that for me. Okay. Might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. His stripes healed us. Mm -hmm. We say that we have died. We are crucified with mm -hmm. Christ. At this point in our program, unfortunately, we had a technical issue that totally eliminated the sound. So we apologize for that, but just appreciate your support in all that Myra and I do to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations. God bless.